الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء محمد رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن ولا وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي حدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار My dear Muslim sisters, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he guide uh, our hearts and that he open our minds and make it um, conforming to and accepting the dalail of Islam, the proofs and the evidences of the Quran and the Sunnah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allow us through the disciplines which he has given to us through his noble messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be able to address the, the rights and the responsibilities of the Muslim women. It is appropriate for us that we begin with some standard ayats of the Quran which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he used to recite as a habit. حق تقاته ولا تمتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون. He said, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, O you who believe, fear Allah with the fear and the consciousness which is His exclusive right, and do not die unless you are in submission to Him or that you are Muslims. He said, Subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya ayyuhan nasu taqu rabbukum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahida wa khalaqa minha zawjaha wa batha minhuma rijalan kathiran wa nisa'a wa taqu allahu alladhi tasa'alun bihi wal arham inna allah kana alaykum raqiba He said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, O oh, mankind, fear your guardian Lord who created you from one single soul and created from it its mate and spread from these two a countless number of men and women. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by whom you demand your mutual rights and give reverence and respect for the wombs that gave you life surely Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is over you as a watcher he said subhanahu wa ta'ala ya ayyuha alladhina amanu taqullah wa qulu qawlan sadidan yuslih lakum a'malakum ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم وما يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما او يو هو بيليف في الله اند سبيك ووردز ذات ار ستريت دايركت اند تروثفول الله سبحانه وتعالى ويل ميك يور ديدز كوركت اند ريكونسايل يور افيرز اند هي ويل اولسو فورغيف يور سينز and whomsoever obeys Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so certainly they will achieve a powerful success. Now these ayats 
are extremely important to be kept in mind in our discussion. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is calling to our minds first, a taqwa. Because before we speak about the issues of rights and responsibilities, there is a necessary tool that you need. The tool is taqwa. To secure those rights and to fulfill those responsibilities, we need taqwa. After that, we should understand that this taqwa is the exclusive right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we need not be conscious of anyone and that we need not feel obligated to anyone and we need not fear the blame of anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we have this feeling of inqiyad, surrender, submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we hope to die in that condition. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cautions us to fear Him as our Rabb, to remind us that these rights and responsibilities and that our risk, our sustenance, whatsoever portion He's going to give us in the life, it is from Him. It is not from anyone else, it is from Him, because He is our Rabb. And He is, by being our Rabb, then the evolution, whatever we will receive that causes us to grow and to develop our complete evolution, He knows what we need and He gives it to us as He gives it to everything else in the creation without us even asking for it. He says, remember that he created you from one single soul. This is important. That Muslims understand that the human beings have been created from one essence. They are dhakr and unfar, two expressions of the same source, male and female. They are from the same source in their essence, but their social role and responsibility, they are not the same. This is from the hikmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And from these two different manifestations, different genders that he created, male and female, our father, Adam السلام, and our common mother Umm Hawa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he spread a countless number of men and women from them that we cannot even measure. And he says, Fear Allah, by whom you demand as a result of these mutual relationships between the male and the female, fear Allah, by whom you demand these mutual rights, and give reverence and preference and respect for the wombs that gave life to you, your mothers, your daughters, your sisters, the women who are themselves the possessors of the wombs. Give them preference. Give them the respect. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is over you as a watcher. He said, subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, fear Allah. وَقُولُ قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا Speak words in seeking your social rights, your political rights, your personal rights. First, be truthful. Be direct. Don't be extreme. Don't be excessive. Don't be subversive. Don't be selfish. And don't falsify. وَقُولُ قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا be straightforward. Then if you do that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He will yuslih lakum a'malakum. He will straighten out. He will reconcile. He will make good. He will make sound. 
your actions, meaning your involvement, your issues. And besides that, where there is some fault on your part, some sin on your part, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ He will forgive you your sins. And whosoever takes this advice and speaks the truth and is in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they obey Allah in his ahkam and they obey the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his sunnah. Then the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says because of this obedience, they will achieve their objectives and they will be successful. These organizers of this um, auspicious gathering, they gave to me, mashallah, a cover letter, uh, and they also added to that cover letter some points they wanted me to take into consideration, which I have done to the best of my ability. Having taken into that consideration, I like to say to you that the problems, challenges, and obstacles facing Muslim women today are staggering and often quite frustrating, compounded by general ignorance, subordination to cultural practices, and subversion by the enemies, the historical enemies of Islam. Now I want to repeat that because in my estimation, from a sociological point of view, and this is the perspective that I'm going to be dealing with here for the most part, from a sociological point of view, these are the reasons why such a staggering set of challenges are facing Muslim women today. One. General frustration. Compounded by general ignorance. That is, people themselves, they simply don't know. So they are ignorant. A word for ignorant in Islam is called jahil. The opposite of having knowledge, according to the Quran and Sunnah, is jahil. Whether you're following your own feeling, the feeling of somebody else, your own conjecture or the conjecture of someone else, your own assumption, it is still jahil. Because for it to be based upon correct knowledge, it has to be from the sources of the Quran and from the sources of the Sunnah. Secondly, subordination to cultural practices. I call it cultural baggage. One of the scholars of Islam, he put it another way. He said, today, Islam has been placed inside of a prison. But the prison is not the prison of the unbelievers. We are today reacting to Muslims being put in the prisons of the unbelievers or the oppression of the unbelievers. But it is Muslims who themselves have placed Islam into a prison and Islam is trying to come out of that prison, but the Muslims have the key and they won't let it out. What is that prison? It is the prison of cultural practice. So Muslims, they are wearing their culture on the outside, practicing their culture on the outside, and Islam is in the inside, and so what most people see is not Islam when they see Muslims, they see the culture of the Muslims. And what we are reacting to with each other for the most part, it is not Islam, it is the culture. And if we do not reverse this trend, if we don't put the culture inside the walls of Islam, you will never find the solution. We will never find the solution. Islam is never meant to be subordinate 
to people's culture. But on the opposite, people's culture must conform to Islam as the water conforms to this vessel. Thirdly, historically, the enemies of Islam have always polluted, distorted the Islamic message to confuse Muslims and also to dissuade non-Muslims who may be attracted towards Islam. These are three of the major problems and challenges. Nevertheless, these challenges are not insurmountable, nor do they exist in a vacuum. They can be evaluated. They can be diagnosed. They can be harnessed. They can be treated with science and medicine. The science is the science of the Quran. The medicine is the medicine of the Sunnah. However, Muslim women themselves, their husbands, their families, their relatives, they must be willing to make a genuine commitment and enter into a direct allegiance with the author of these sources, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and place themselves under the care and the guidance of the dispenser, Al Qasim, the dispenser of these sources, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we put ourselves under and make a genuine commitment to the Quran and place ourselves under the care of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as we go to a doctor and we accept his diagnosis and we place ourselves under his care and we take the prescription that he gives to us, if we do that Islamically, you'll find that these problems, gradually, we will place them under control. Today, we want to survey the rights and responsibilities of the Muslim women in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah. We want to look at what our contemporary situation and circumstances dictate for us, because it's important that we look at things in the light of our present situation and circumstances and not always looking back. The sources, for the sources we look back, but for the solution we have to look in the present and we have to look towards the future. And what advice has been given to us by present scholars and students of knowledge on a wide range of topics. Now, what I will uh, attempt to do here, because in my estimation, there is such a wide range of evidence available for us on the internet. So why should Brother Khalid Yassin, who is a student of a student of a student, why should he be giving to you some things from the top of his head when there are people who themselves are certified scholars and students of knowledge, they have written, they have codified, they have made it available for us on the internet, and so we should make use of that. So from time to time, I'm going to make use of a, uh, a website here, uh, and you please uh, bear with me because I'm not as technically uh, capable as I might be able to talk. Where's Brother Kashif? What I would like to do while uh, my brother is um, accessing uh, one of these websites for me, I would like our brother, Sheikh Faisal. Sheikh Faisal, mashallah. Brother Faisal. I would like our Sheikh Faisal to please read from Surah Al Rum, uh, and uh, I will just uh, then read the, um, the English translation, uh, translation and uh, this will be discussing uh, some issues in the light of these uh, ayat, inshallah. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ومن آياته أن خلقكم من تراب 
ثم إذا أنتم بشر تنتشرون And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and among his signs is that he created you, that is Adam alayhi salam, and Um Hawa, from the rib of Adam, he created them from dust, and then from the rib of Adam, and then his offspring from the semen, and behold, you are human beings scattered. ومن آياته أن خلق لكم من أنفسكم أزواجا لتسكنوا إليها وجعل بينكم مودة ورحمة إن في ذلك لآيات لقوم يتفكرون. And among his signs is that he created for you wives from among yourselves that you may find tranquility in them. And he has put between you affection and mercy. Verily, in that are indeed signs for a people who reflect. ومن آياته خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف ألسنتكم وألوانكم إن في ذلك لآيات للعالمين للعالمين. And among his signs. Is the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the differences of your languages and your colors, verily in that are indeed signs for men of sound knowledge. Nay, but those who do wrong follow their own desires and lusts without any knowledge. Then who will guide him whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent astray? And for such there will be no helpers. فأقم وجهك للدين حنيفا فطرة الله التي فطر الناس عليها لا تبديل لخلق الله ذلك دين قيم ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون. So set your face towards the pure Islamic monotheist religion, the Deen of Hanif. Worship none but Allah. Allah's fitra, that is the natural state of our creation, with which He has created mankind. No change. Let there be in the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the straight religion, but most of men do not know. Munibina ilayhi wa attaquuh wa aqeemu salah wa la takunu min al-mushrikeen. Zahar al-fasadu fi al-barri wa al-bahar bima kasaba aydi al-nas liyudhiqahum ba'da al-ladhi amilu la'allahum yarji'oon. Evil, sins, corruption, and disobedience to Allah has appeared on the land and the sea because of what the hands of men have earned by oppression and evil deeds. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may make them taste a part of that which they have done in order that they may return by repenting to Allah and begging His pardon. قل سيروا في الأرض فانظروا كيف كان عاقبة الذين من قبل كان أكثرهم مشركين. Say, O Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, travel through the land and see what was the end of those before you. Most of them were مشركين, polytheists, idolaters, disbelievers in the oneness of Allah. فأقيم وجهك للدين القيم. من قبل أن يأتي يوم لا مرد له من الله يوم إذ يصدعون. So set your face in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa taala to the straight and right path before there comes from Allah a day which none of you can avert and on that day men shall be divided in groups a group in paradise and a group in hell. My dear uh, Muslim sisters, we read these uh, verses.
so that it serves as a means of reflection and a means of reference, especially so that when we complete uh, this gathering uh, and, the, and this is edited for us, uh, we will be able to again refer back to these ayats, inshallah, for our reflection. I have uh, here something from Professor Abdul Rahman Adoy, who is a well-known uh, professor of Islamic studies. So Professor Doy has given to us, mashallah, uh, women in the Quran and the Sunnah. And what I'd like you to do is to write these references down. I'm just going to read maybe some reference from it, but I would request from you and I would suggest to you that each one of these references, you write them down because later on you're going to find them extremely resourceful and necessary for you to be able to do your own research and study on this topic because what I'm just going to do simply is navigate. I'm going to navigate you to the sources, make some comments and come out of the source and go to another source insha'Allah ta'ala. One, I'd like to say to our sisters that there are many rights and responsibilities. Among the rights and responsibilities, we deal first with the rights because everyone wants their rights even before they are prepared to fulfill their responsibilities. Sometimes we want the house before we even think of what it will cost. We want the house before we think of what it will take to maintain it. We want the wife or the husband. We want the benefit and the pleasure before we think about what the responsibility will be to maintain that or to fulfill that. So, in keeping with human nature, let us discuss the rights first. The first right is the right of justice. Every Muslim woman has the right to have justice. And that justice that she has a right to is her right whether she's living among the Muslims or living among the non-Muslims. She has recourse to justice. Whether she's living in a Muslim country where there is Islamic judicial institutions or whether she's living in a non-Muslim country where there are no Islamic judicial institutions, she still has a right to justice. And her right to justice never is taken back because of where she is. The Muslim woman has the right to have her person, her property, her honor respected by Muslims and non-Muslims. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, كل مسلم حرام كل مسلم على المسلم حرام دمه وماله وارضه او كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم the whole of a muslim to another muslim is sacred inviolable meaning haram you cannot transgress it you cannot transgress it دمه that means the blood. Blood meaning what is running in your body as well as your family. Malahu, your property, whether material or financial. Wa irduhu, your honor, your reputation. And we can recall on one occasion when the honor of a Muslim woman was violated in a non-Muslim place and that issue reached the Khalifa. Only that woman's honor was violated and the Khalifa 
sent a message to those people that if that issue was not rectified, he will come there and conquer that whole place just because of the honor of that woman. Subhanallah. You see, the justice of Islam, the Muslim leader, he was not thinking just to go there and straighten out who did that. No, he told them, the honor of that Muslim woman is so great that if you don't apologize and straighten it out, I will come there and conquer your whole country. Today, we have no such people. Also, the equality of the Muslim woman. We don't mean the sameness. We mean equality in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is her right before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be judged in accordance to Islamic Sharia. That is with a man or another woman or any human being, whether she is a woman who is poor, to be judged in the same way along with the ruler of the Muslims. Because in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the sight of Sharia, women have equal status with men. The right for them to be dealt with with kindness, more so than that of men, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he is addressing the affairs of women, when he is addressing the person of women, and when the Prophet sallallahu dealt with the women of his family and other women, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses a special language and he uses a special manner, treating them with a sense of being fragile, care, knowing that they are different from the men. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said, he did not mean that men they have some special excellence over women as some men they maybe they want to think no Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he placed the men in a position over the women to protect them because they are fragile just like a mother hen how she will sit over top of those eggs why? Because those eggs are fragile. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has her to sit over them, to protect them, to care for them, and to use her body as a screen for them because she can absorb more than those eggs who have to hatch. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the men to be the protectors, the sustainers of the women in that regard. He called them kawam because they are fragile. They have an absolute right for social participation. The men, they have no right to use cultural means or political means or personal means or ethnic means to cast the woman in some kind of way like they are below them or they are some kind of different kind of species. We don't want to see them. No, this is from the culture and the insecurity of men. Although, for sake of fitna and for protection of the dignity and the honor of women, there is something called hijab. And the Prophet wasallam, he exercised this and he recommended that and he ordered that among his own women and among the people of the Sahaba and the Tabi'een and the Tabi'een. But I want to remind the Muslim men we should not become extreme in this issue because in the beginning when the ayats of hijab was re reported, was related, we knew how the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu they responded to it and that is the basic understanding we have, how they responded. At the same token, in the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu there was no curtains at that time. No curtains. We know this by evidence from Asbab al-Nuzul ayats that came down telling the men to lower their gaze and guard their modesty there was no need to say that if there was hijab in the mosque in their places of gathering we know also from asbab al nuzul on one occasion when some women from medina came to the masjid of the prophet sallallahu and one of those women was very beautiful and the men knew she was coming and they was in the salah looking under their arms in sajda and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say i know what goes before you and what go behind you 
how they was looking under their arms to see a look at that woman if there was a curtain in the mosque. So we know that there is no need for men from a point of culture to exaggerate issues that put the women in situations of discomfort and do not give them the proper rights as is afforded to men, such as we go to places where the men gather and the women gather and we find huge places, mosques, wide open, well lit, well carpeted, with facilities for the men. And then we find some little dark stairways going around to the side or the back with no lights, smelling bad, restricted for the women who in most cases number more than the men. This is from culture, this is not from Islam. And we men, we have to correct this because the women, they have the right to have social participation equal with us. We should ask ourselves, and the women should also ask the question, the women of this locality, what are their numbers in proportion to men? Then the space that should be given for the women in the mosque should be in according to their proportion and not designed in such a way to give them some little small place to suggest that only a small, some small group of women should come there from time to time. Women should have full access to all the Islamic, to all the social institutions, so they have the chance to develop as human beings alongside of the men. Secondly, women must have proper representation. Whether she has a wakil or whether she has a wali, whether she has a natural wali or whether she has a surrogate wali, whether she has someone selected as her wakil or someone who is her natural wakil, women must have representation and it is not something that is ordered upon them, it is something which is a right of theirs because without a wakil, again, they don't have proper representation. And Aisha radiallahu anha, she reported from the Prophet sallallahu that no woman must be the wakil of another woman. No woman must marry without a wali. And if she marries without a wali, her marriage is void, her marriage is void, her marriage is void. And we also know that Muslim women, if they need to travel, they need to go someplace where they will be exposed to the public. They need to have with them something called mahram. All of these is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Muslim women as a right of their protection. It is not something to encumber them, to make something difficult for them, that they can't move like the men can move. No, because they are gentle, because they are fragile, because they are expensive, and because they are the ones that guard the inner sanctum of the Islamic society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants them to be protected just like money that's being taken to the bank by a big company. You see, if you were a big company and you had big deposits to make to the bank or money going from the central bank to the small bank, it is going by Ahmad Khan. And if your money is inside there, you will want it to go along with that armored car to be protected. So our women, they are more valuable to us than the money that is in that armored car. No one will take money from one big bank to another without an armored car. So no Muslim lady must be traveling without mahram. And the men who allow their women to go without representation, without protection, on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not even look at them. And there is a word in Arabic about these kind of men who have no, th no concern about their women be mixing with the men and just traveling about and they don't care. Their women and their, da their daughters and their wives and their mothers just traveling. And what is the term in, in Arabic, Sheikh? You know that's name? Yeah, I will think about it. It's a, it's a very strong terminology and Allah will not look at them on the Day of Judgment. Secondly, the Muslim women have the right to have full ownership of their property in any amount they want. 
the woman, she can own a bank, her own airline. She can have her own industry. She can have thousands of men working for her. As Khadija, Sayyida Khadija radiallahu anha, she had our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa working for her. Subhanallah. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put our Prophet وسلم, in subordination and made his boss a woman, mashallah. And that same woman who was his boss, his supervisor, the owner of a company, also was the one that directed him towards someone to explain for him what that vision was that he saw when Jibreel alayhi salam came to him. Subhanallah, how Allah used a woman to benefit our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and to benefit this deen. The woman has complete control of her property. Even when she marries, her property never falls into the hands of her husband. She can share with him if she wants to, but he cannot take any portion of it. Also, her property is her property. It is not her father's property. It is not her son's property. It is not her brother's property. And she has that property even though her father, her son, her brother, or her husband still have to take care of her. I think this, is, this uh, subhanAllah, I think when the, the people start talking about the rights of Muslim women being oppressed, we need to bring that point out. Uh, brother Kashif, my computer it just died again. So this issue of ownership of property is absolute. Something that the non-Muslim women, until just 30 or 40 or 50 years ago in the most sophisticated countries, they did not have that right. Also, they have what is called due process in the law. Due process. Witnesses can be brought against them. They can be brought forward also as witnesses and no one can just treat them and just make judgments against them without due process. Even when Umar ibn al-Khattab gave his opinion about the amount of dowry which a woman she can receive, this was his opinion. A woman, she stood up and said, Ya Amir al this opinion which you gave is your own personal opinion, but this is not consistent with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And she gave him the dalil, and she was very forceful in what she said to him. And Umar, mashallah, he was sitting in the bench of his authority. And that woman, she was not afraid, and she spoke directly to him. And that day, Umar al Khattab, subhanallah, he respected the dalil, and he said, Today, Umar has been corrected by a woman because he's proving as a representative of the Prophet وسلم, that women have their right and their position and access to their proof and evidence and due process. Secondly, can you put it on the timer so it will not go off, inshallah. Second, another thing, I want to remind you that during the time of Umar ibn Khattab, he assigned a woman to be the supervisor, the marshal of all the, the souk, all the marketplaces of Medina. That means her job was to make sure what people were selling, how they was buying, how they was gathering, make sure the weight and the measures, make sure what is being sold, what substance are being sold. And she had under her administration many men. And people came to Umar ibn al-Khattab and they complained to him and said, Ya Umar, how you will put a woman in charge like that and then we will have to be subordinate to her? He said, this is my choice. This is my decision. So you go back and report to her. Also, women have the absolute right of protection. They are the first protected species. The men and the women, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I mean the women and the children. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in this ayah, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the men strength and sustenance which makes it their duty to protect those women and those children. Secondly, they have the absolute right of support. 
If she doesn't want to work, she doesn't have to work at all. Subhanallah. The women, they can go to school, get a master's degree, a PhD, and after that, she doesn't even have to work. Seem to me, this is a very advantageous position. And she still has to be supported by her husband and her father and her brother and her son. And she doesn't have to spend any of her money that she collects on anything but herself. I think this is a good deal. This is why historically the wealth has always gathered in the hands of women in the Ummah of Muhammad Wasallam, Because the fathers and the sons and the brothers and the husbands, they always have to keep giving and giving. You know, you're always asking and asking. So the man, he winds up really having nothing at the end because then it will be split up between his family. But the women, they still wind up with more. This is the wisdom of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guarantee those women their protection and their property and their dignity and their honor which Allah gave to the women 1500 years ago. Secondly, the women they have their own right for marriage and to be given a free gift at marriage too. Another gift Allah gave to them. In some uh, uh, religions and some cultures, if the woman gets married, she, her family have to give a dowry to the man. In Islam, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said this is her absolute right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only made the private parts of women lawful by the payment of the dowry. This is what the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said. The payment of the dowry. Secondly, Muslim women have their own right to divorce. The first right is in the hands of the man who is sustaining her, who is protecting her, who is taking care and preserving her and representing her. Yes, it is his first right. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the women a back door, an emergency door, that if that man for some reason or that relationship for some reason, she doesn't want it anymore, she has a back door called khula. And although Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns her and the Prophet name warned her that Allah curses the woman that seeks divorce without a good reason, still she has that back door. And so we realize the first khula in Islam, how it came. The wife, I think his name is Ibn Qais, she came to the Prophet وسلم, and said, Ya Rasulullah وسلم, my husband is one of the best Muslims of Medina. But I think if I stay with him, I will endanger my religion. Some of the ulama, they said that when she married Ibn Qais, she thought he was a good looking brother. But when she saw him one day walking between two handsome men, she said, oh, no, I don't want him. <laughs> Subhanallah. But she, she said he's a very good Muslim, one of the best Muslims of Medina. And she came to the Prophet ﷺ. This shows us many lessons. That the Muslim lady, she has the right to go to the, uh, to the Wali al-Amr, whoever is controlling the power of the Muslims, the judge or the Qadi, or the Imam, the Muslim lady, she have the right to go. The man, he can't say, I don't, I, I forbid you to go. No, she have the right to go. The second lesson, she said only good things about him. She never said anything bad. She only said, I think if I remain with him, I will endanger my religion. Subhanallah, how she spoke. And how the Prophet ﷺ responded, he said, will you give him back the dowry which he gave to you? She said, yes. The Messenger of Allah وسلم, he did not call Ibn Qais to discuss the matter with him. He simply brought, called him and said, give, take back from her the dowry which you gave. And then he told her to observe the idda for one month. 
There's many lessons just in this small situation. Many lessons. This only shows that the Prophet ﷺ, he gave the qada to this woman based upon her statement. And that he did not give Ibn Qais even any choice about that matter. Subhanallah. And the women, they must have equal access for education. To seek knowledge of Quran, to seek knowledge of the Sunnah, to seek all the sciences of Islam, and also ilm al dunyawiyah. If the men can go to school to learn the sciences, to become professionals, who is it can say the woman they cannot do that? No, the woman's place is in the home, yes, no doubt. That is her major station. But if she can take care of that station and also maintain a position of excellence in professional life or business, she has the right just like the men. All of these are some of the rights, and there are more. But I think you would agree with me that this is a tremendous amount of rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Muslim women 1,426 years ago. And the non-Muslim women, even until today, they do not have access to these same rights. And if they do have access to them, they don't have it by virtue of legislation itself. Now let us talk about the responsibilities. The Muslim ladies, and uh, uh, you please, I think the sister, she said from the beginning, there's one hour for the first session, is it? How much time do we have for this first session? Is it 10, 15 minutes left? I'd just like to know, inshallah. Is it? 15 minutes? Jazakumullah khairan. So we will deal with these responsibilities, uh, hopefully, in the, uh, I will go through them. And then in the next session, then we're going to uh, sort of summarize, talk about some of the problems, and then we'll have a Q&A, inshallah. The responsibilities. One, to guard their morality. And I put that first, because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said to his companions, I leave behind you no fitna greater than the fitna of women. Now this fitna is not the fault of women. So the husband, he don't have a right to say, yeah, you see, you are a big fitna. <laughs> no, the fitna of the women is mostly caused by the men. It is not a fitna by the women themselves. It is a fitna because of the reaction of the men themselves. So the Prophet ﷺ told us, be careful how you deal with the women. Because how you deal with them, how you react to them, how you interact with them, how you fulfill their rights, or how you transgress upon those rights, or how you leave them to violate those rights even themselves or those responsibilities will become a great fitna. So we see today the greatest fitna of the developed societies today is the fitna of naked women. And one of the signs of the destruction of a nation is when the women take off their clothes. There's an ayah which we read here having to do with that. Any society where rape and incest and fornication and adultery and drinking and debauchery and sodomy and lesbianism and all kinds of filthy things like that start to taking place, common way, it means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is assigned for that society Destruction. Now that destruction will not necessarily happen like that. But you will start to see the erosion from the inside, the crumbling. We have seen in this society where we're living, in the Western society, on the outside, we see the McDonald's, the Burger King, the Pizza Hut type uh, mascara. Lipstick, we call it. Burger King. The big buildings and all of that, this is the mascara and the lipstick of the society, the falseness of the woman's beauty, you see. But on the inside, 
she's just a prostitute filthy no virtue whatsoever we're talking about the society here and so one of the things you see is that she has lost her dignity she has lost her honor she no longer has any dignity or honor the society we're talking about and one of the first things is that the family itself disappears today there is a social statistic that only one in 17 families eat breakfast together or eat dinner together so if they don't eat breakfast and dinner together how they will maintain how they will supervise how will they will coordinate the values of the family because dad he's rushing out the house with a croissant and a, and, and a cup of coffee and a, and a cigarette mom she's packing the lunch to the kids some Kool-Aid and some other little sandwiches or cookies put in the bag for them and she's off on to, she's going to her job. The kids are eating by themselves, the parents are eating by themselves, and when the children come home, they're, they call them latchkey kids, I think you call them, meaning they let themselves in the house by themselves. Dad is still at the work or at the pub. Mom, she's shopping or she's at the hairdresser, she didn't get home yet. She left a microwave dinner on the stove for the kids or she just told them go to McDonald's or go to Pizza Hut or something, get yourself something, I'll be home soon. By the time mom comes home, the kids have already watched two or three hours of whatever kind of TV they can watch. By the time dad gets home, they usually sleep or pretending to be sleep. The children have a television in their room, so Janie has her own TV. Johnny got his own TV, mom and dad got their TV, and there's another TV in the room, in the living room for the guests. This is the modern nuclear family. The family has disappeared. Another sign of the erosion of the society, another sign that their destruction is imminent. So the Muslim woman must guard her morality because by the Muslim woman, Guarding her morality, she will fortify the Muslim society. And as the other society on the outside is crumbling apart, the Muslim society is building and developing. And all we have to do is leave them to themselves. Like rotten teeth, they will just fall out. Our children and our wives and our families will be fortified. They will grow. And the other people, their families will fall apart. We will have fabric, they will have no fabric. And this is the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Muslim lady must preserve her dignity. The outward sign of her dignity is her hijab. You must all be muhajabat. You must not leave from your homes without your hijab. And the hijab al-mar'a is very clear. It is her uniform. Allah gave to you a uniform. Like in an army, there is a uniform. Like the hostesses on the airplane, they have a uniform. Like the doctors have a uniform, like the police have a uniform. Every important group of people that have a specific job, they have a uniform. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Muslim ladies their own uniform. Never leave your home without your uniform. Shame on the men who allow their women to leave without their uniform. Because what will a policeman look like if he did not have on his uniform and he ordering people around and stopping you on the side of the highway and he got his hat, a baseball cap on and some trainers? Unless he's undercover. He must have on his uniform because this will keep him conscious of what he's doing. If he doesn't have on his uniform, maybe he's inside the pub dancing around. Maybe he's in some kind of brothel over there seeking some prostitute. But if he have on his uniform, his badge, his gun, his radio, all of that, how will he look inside the pub dancing around and drinking beer and alcohol in a brothel someplace? So similarly, the Muslim lady, if she has on her uniform, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us this so she will be protected 
from the outside and from the inside. You must protect your home. You are the ministers of the interior. One of the most important governmental positions. My wife, she liked me to say that. So when I come home, she's telling me what to do. And it's her right. Inside the house, she should tell me what to do. Sit down over there. Go over there. Go get this for me. Alhamdulillah, this is her right, mashallah. Why? Because this is her area. But she must also, when I'm not there, she must also protect it. She must be the guardian, the harissa. She had to be standing, watching, checking the children going in and out, who's coming, who's going, what's being delivered, what's being done, who's watching this, who's reading this, what activities are going, what's being spent. She must be watching, checking, because this is her job. Because if the women do not protect the home, who's going to protect the home? She has a double job to do. And we do not envy the women. They have to do jobs on the outside where they are held responsible and accountable, and they also are held responsible for doing the job on the inside. They must cultivate their families. Yuzakihin, they must purify them, him, and also cultivate them, grow them, charge them, counsel them, watch them, cultivate them. They must advise their husbands, ad-deen and nasiha. They conform to his orders, to his pleasure, but they also advise him. Especially at the time of Fajr, you Muslim ladies, you must become people of Fajr. Because if you are people of Fajr, then you have the right to advise your husband and chase him out of the house at the time of Fajr. Wake him up, aggravate him. Say to him, brother, you don't want to go to the masjid and pray? Subhanallah, Habibi, 27, 27 rewards you would get for, for us. No, no, get up out of the bed, go and pray. Subhanallah, what's wrong with you? And then, if he doesn't get up, go and get some water. You see? And uh, throw some water on him and then run and close the door. He will be angry that you did that, but once he gets the habit of performing the Fajr, he will love you for that. So become women of the Fajr. Also, when you want to advise your husbands, advise them in a nice way. Say to him, don't say, oh, you know, you always say you're gonna do this, you're gonna do that, you don't never do what you say. No, tell him, say, Ya Habibi, listen, you know, did you ever, did you read this hadith? I had read this hadith from the Prophet wasallam. You know, I was reading this ayah of Quran, and I was wondering, did you know the tafsir of this ayah? Oh, you know, I was reading this book of fiqh, and I didn't quite understand this terminology. What do you think it means over here? You see, oh, you know, I was just thinking, I was supposed to buy something, and I didn't remember, did you pay me the dowry? <laughs> You know, in a nice way. So the man, subhanAllah, he will know how you're reminding him and he will not mind. But you should not be very badgering. But you should advise them. The woman must participate in the society. You have responsibilities in the society. Your responsibility is not just for yourself and is not just for your home. You must think about your neighborhood. What has happened? I think the, I think the battery's gone flat. Don't worry, I will talk. Can you hear me, sisters? Yeah. Very good. Let me bring the water here, inshallah. You must participate in the society. You must ask your neighbor, see what their condition is. 
Look across the road. Look down the road. See who your neighbors are on your way to the shop, on your way to work. See who they are. The five neighbors on this side, on that side, in front of you, in back of you. Find out their names so that you can serve them. You can know them. If your street is cluttered, there's something dangerous, you should report it. You should be involved in your parent-teacher association. You should be involved in the neighborhood council. You should be knowing what's going on, who's coming, going, who should not be in the neighborhood. You should be watching, not just in other people's business, but looking out into the issues which is part of your business. Participate in the society. Don't just be looking at the TV, looking in the magazines, looking on something for your own self, looking in the refrigerator, only looking to see going window shopping for yourself, for your children. No, be concerned about your neighbor because the Prophet Sallallahu on his deathbed, when he was dying, Jibreel Alayhi kept coming to him, asking him about the neighbor. So much so the Prophet Sallallahu he said he thought maybe that the neighbor had a right to his inheritance. Ask about your neighbor. Get to know your neighbor. Interact with your neighbor. When your neighbor has a concern for you, when you have concern for your neighbor, respect for your neighbor, you will find the neighbor will have concern and respect for you. Then the neighbor will see Islam through you. Be involved in your society. Be an example for other women. Compete with other women in taqwa, in knowledge, in adab, in sacrifice, in seeking knowledge. Be example for other women. Compete with each other. Have Quran memorizing circles. 10, 15 sisters get together once a month or twice a month in another sister's house and they compete with each other to memorize Quran, to memorize a hadith of the Prophet wasallam. They discuss with each other ways and means of perfecting their hijab, dealing with their children, dealing with issues. Be an example for your children. The woman that sleeps through the fajr or doesn't perform her prayers, generally speaking, her family, they also will do the same. The woman who watches a lot of TV, her family will do the same. The woman that is selfish, she will raise a selfish family. The woman is the first university. What she teaches the family, in most cases, the family will never unlearn it. They will carry it the rest of their lives. Secure, functional knowledge. Sisters, before you start learning, you know, sometimes sisters, they want to learn. I want to memorize the whole Quran. Sisters make this, they say, this is my objective, my goal. I want to memorize the whole Quran. But the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they used to memorize 10 ayats and then act upon it. And then learn 10 ayats and act upon it. So all of us should want to memorize the Quran, but memorize it like that. So your knowledge becomes functional. Memorize Juz al-Amma and the tafsir of it from Ibn Kathir and the Asbab al-Nuzul how those, why those ayats were revealed under what circumstances. Memorize the Arba'in ahadith of Imam Nawawi and then get the explanation of it from some ulama or fuqaha. Then after that, go on to issues of usul, usul fiqh. Understand the seerah of the Prophet wasallam. Understand issues relative to your salah and your tahara. This is functional knowledge. Obtain that first before you go on to more difficult things. Obtain the very best education that you can. Shame on us living in the West where you have access to education and the Muslim ladies, they don't take advantage of it. And even you don't have to leave from your home in many cases to obtain a degree. This is what you need to know also. Today with the internet, someone said, on the internet, there are more than 716 different degrees that a woman can earn without even leaving her home. Subhanallah. Secondly, fulfill your Islamic duties. Your 
Islamic duty between yourself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your Islamic duty to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Your Islamic duty to the leader of the Muslims. Your Islamic duty to your husband. Your Islamic duty to your family. Your Islamic duty to the community. Your Islamic duty to one another. Guard your tongues. There's nothing more destructive for Muslim women than the tongue. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to a group of men and women, if you guarantee me two things, I will guarantee you paradise. He said, the tongue and the private parts. And one time when the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was passing through his masjid and there was a group of women sitting there, he said, oh women, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala allowed me to look into the hellfire. And I saw that most of its inhabitants, many of its inhabitants, there was women. And those women asked him, how come you said that? He said, because many of them, they, they, they gossip and they talk too much. And they are ungrateful to their husbands. So that when their husband gives them something and spent all, everything on them, they say, oh, shukran, jazakallah khairan. But when they are angry with him, they say, oh, you never did nothing for me. And they are also given to gossip, tail bearing, using the telephone. You know, telephone, tell a woman. There's two ways of communication. Telephone and tell a lady. Why? Because you have more time. You're more provocative. The men, they do the same thing but in different ways. But because when you do it, it is more dangerous because you stand between the men and the children. Guard your tongues. The Prophet Sallallahu said, let him who believes in Allah in the last day either say what's good or keep quiet. So when you see sisters talking foolishness, say, sister, listen, if you don't have nothing good to say, my suggestion for you is, uskut, keep quiet. This is what the Prophet Sallallahu said, don't be angry with me. Also, initiate da'wah among the women. I will tell you a statistic. 108,000, somewhere around that figure, people became Muslims between Great Britain um, North America and Australia last year. 108,000. And I will tell you that 63% of them were women. This means about 69,000 women. The other statistic I want to share with you is that The opportunities to give da'wah among women are greater than the opportunities among men because women, they don't have the same level of ego. Women have vanity, but men, they have ego. And vanity is different from ego. Ego is like climbing up a mountain, going through a steel wall. Vanity is a matter of logistics. And women, they can penetrate the vanity of another woman. But sometimes it's very difficult to penetrate the ego of a man. And this is why I find that women tend that when you tell them they're doing something that is wrong and they see it is very clearly wrong and silly, they have a tendency to accept it and change. Men, they get an attitude. Why are you talking to me like that? They don't want to change. They don't want to get angry. They don't want to fight. So take the opportunity to initiate da'wah so that we men, we don't have to do that because there's a special fitna for the men who have to give da'wah for the women. We have to do it if the sisters, they don't do it. But that's not our job. And there's, there's a great liability for doing that. And I tell the brothers, if you can avoid doing direct da'wah to sisters, leave it alone, leave it for the sisters. Or if a woman is interested, send her to your wife. Uh, as long as the, the wife don't think she's going to become another wife. 
If that's the case, send it to somebody else. But you sisters have a rare opportunity to participate in the da'wah. Oh, we can, we, we're going to come back to that topic a little bit later on. Don't worry. I know some of you is thinking why he said that. I, we're going to come back to the issue about the other wife later, inshallah. Initiate the da'wah among the women because that's your job. Because I believe, I believe that the da'wah, more so than any other element, will contribute towards the Islamization of this society and this civilization. Because through the da'wah, we can enter the hearts, we can penetrate the minds, we can capture the whole family. And once people become Muslims, you don't think they're going to drop bombs on their own cities. They're not going to put their own children in Guantanamo Bay or Belmarsh or whatever prison they have here. No, so we should give the da'wah because the da'wah is the imperceptible way of communication. We can capture hearts, we can capture minds for Islam, and in some cases it is irresistible. Promote resource development. Muslims today need resources. We need human resources. We need material resources. And we Muslims need to concentrate on strategies for developing resources. And since I already spoke about the issue that women have more money than men, in many cases, men, women are more talented than men for certain things. See how the sisters have organized this. If this was organized by the men, it wouldn't have, been, it wouldn't have happened on time. All the things would have not been here. Every time the sisters organize something, always it's better than the men. Whenever there is a masjid or an organization that has the participation of the men, they have a much better chance of being successful. When the women are not there, usually you find the men going to be stagnant, dark, not without coordination. They miss all the little small things. They don't cross the T's. They don't dot the I's. They're always forgetting things. Because the women, they're going to make that list. You see, they're always going to be asking, bothering us. Did you do this, honey? Did you take care of that? Sister, did you so-and-so? They got the old list. And all. Men don't like to be told like that. So the brothers should take the lesson that when you have a project, make sure you got a committee of sisters. Chances are that project is going to go all right. Muslim women should also be involved in defending the ummah. Learn to write, learn to speak, learn to do research, learn to argue in the best way. As Allah subhanahu wa says, وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Learn to defend the ummah from poison, from enemies, from dangers, from things that we may not see coming. And finally, Muslim women, you must support community projects. And when there's an issue that needs to be addressed, do not be afraid to say, this. we have to form some kind of a, uh, a think tank, a committee to deal with this issue. If the imam or the brothers don't want you to meet in the mosque, then meet in the library, meet in your homes. If the imam don't want to meet with you, meet with his wife. If you don't have a wife, I don't know who you'll meet with then. <laughs> Give him a wife. Maybe that's his problem. Support the community projects, because without your support, chances are the projects are going nowhere. So sisters, for this session, I have covered some of the rights and some of the responsibilities. And now I want to just, before we end the session, I want to read to you because I think it's too much information for me to read from the sources themselves. So I'm going to give you the sources. So if you would just uh, bear with me a moment. And if you have your pen, I'm going to give you some sources. One, 
the Muslim woman and her rights. Or if you like, I can have Brother Kashif doing the uh, intermission. He can write them down and put them up on the screen. Is that better? Good. Because I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine different websites that themselves, one of them, one of these websites have over 74 different links. So I think that the contribution I'm trying to make to you is that I'm going to provide you with the resources for you to do the research to broaden this topic for yourselves, inshallah. Then when we come back after the re re recess, uh, I want to talk about some of the special problems that we have to deal with in to deal with these rights and these responsibilities. And then after that, perhaps we can have some questions and answers. Would that be appropriate? OK. Um, Inshallah, during the questions and answers, uh, our Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Faisal, he will assist me, inshallah, um, uh, with that, uh, because it's always good uh, to have someone who has a more formal background in issues of uh, fiqh or Islamic studies. So he will assist me in that. Uh, so uh, after the break, uh, we'll deal with some of the special problems, observations from my part, uh, and then after that, we'll have some Q&A to uh, see if we can resolve some of the special issues. Uh, that you may see yourselves. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdikum wa nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta wa nastaghfiruk wa natubu alayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa azwajihi wa man wala wa ba'd. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Uh, dear Muslim sisters, thank you very much for your uh, patience and uh, tolerance uh, for us to be able to synchronize the uh, technical issues here, inshallah. Uh, the other thing is that um, we will try not to go much beyond the allotted time. Um, to complete our task, inshallah. Uh, before we go to the, uh, the issues of the, uh, the questions um, and their um, subsequent answers, I just want to talk about some of the problems uh, that I see in this topic that we're talking about. And I'm speaking here as a, um, I'm, trying to be, I'm trying to be objective as a father, uh, as a husband, uh, as a brother, as a, uh, a responsible Muslim. But I'm also speaking as a, um, a sociologist, a person um, having some background and um, special um, involvement and training in the field of sociology. So when I speak about some of these problems, um, someone else may review them from a fiqh point of view. And as these questions come, I can already see that many of these questions, uh, I'm, people are asking me questions as if I have the capacity to be able to answer these from a fiqh or ahkam point of view. I do not, and I will not. Uh, because there are people in your locale, people that are here in your country, in your area, your city, who have the qualifications, even if they are not willing, and even if they are not accessible sometimes, I should not do that because I don't have their qualification. The second thing uh, is that I am steering you towards references that are reliable, um, that are reputable, and that are accessible. So many of the questions that some sisters are asking, you're going to find it when you go to these references. So this is not going to be a shake and bake deal, that you're just going to write some questions and Khalid is going to take the responsibility to answer them or Sheikh Faisal is going to do that. No. You're going to do some work, and we're going to do some work. So if there is a way for me to be able to respond to this from my background, 
familiarity, I will do that. The Sheikh will also help me. But if I choose not to answer a question, it is because you will find the answers in the references that I'm giving to you. Because five or six of these references, they are websites of people who themselves can give fatawa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاسْأَلُهُ أَهْلِ ذِكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of the dhikr. It means the people of the dhikr. The dhikr means Quran and Sunnah. Ask the people of the Quran and the Sunnah. That means ask the ulama and ask the fuqaha if you don't know. So some of the special problems. One, and I'm just going to deal with 10 of the most obvious problems that there are relative to Muslim ladies seeking their rights and fulfilling their responsibilities, uh, both in the Muslim world as well as in places where we are living as minorities, such as Australia. Number one, the first problem is social and political contradictions within Muslim societies themselves. This is one of the major problems that we are unable in many cases to make a reference <coughs> to Muslim societies to resolve our problems because in many cases, in fact, in most cases, the social and political contradictions that exist in Muslim countries are so rampant and so staggering and so complex that we cannot even use them as a reference in many cases. I don't say we can't use scholars who are in those countries. I say that the contradictions, the social and political contradictions in the form of institutions are so contradictory that we are not able to use them as a reference. I mean, contradictory towards the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. That's one problem. The second problem, that many of the rights and responsibilities of Muslim women are being subverted and resisted and denied by Muslim governments themselves. Now, I take the responsibility of saying this, so the Sheikh is not saying this, I'm saying this. And I'm saying this having visited at least 27 Muslim governments. If I was only there for a week or 10 days, I have visited them, and I saw for myself what contradictions are there, um, and what resistance and denial and subversion of the rights and responsibilities of Muslim women exist inside those countries. So this is the second problem. I take the responsibility of, of this myself, and I don't mind. Number three, cultural and ethnic practices that eclipse and nullify the Islamic sources. People practicing cultural and ethnic issues and they are so blindly attached to those cultural and ethnic issues that when you tell them Allah said, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, the Sharia provides, they don't even care. So it means the, the ahkam or the principle of the sunnah is completely eclipsed. You cannot see it. There's no appreciation, no application for it, because the people, they prefer the cultural or the ethnic issue. It could be an ethnic prejudice or an ethnic preference. It could be a cultural practice or just some cultural aberration. Then, prevailing customs, persuasions, and personalized trends, styles, that establish innovations. I'll repeat that. Prevailing, that means dominant 
customs, persuasions, like a sister, she asked me a question one day. After we clearly read the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu about it being forbidden for women to tie their hair on top of their head and for women to be shaving and shaping the eyebrows. Her sister then she wrote and said, well, Sheikh, is it all right if because I want to appear nice to my husband if I have my eyebrows lifted? So in spite of the fact, we, want it, we still want to see if we can scout around, skirt around, subvert, we can twist it, bend it. No, the Muslim is not like that. Kulu qawlan sadida. You hear it straight, you respond to it straight. If someone owes you money, you want it counted out completely. So when Allah orders you something, you respond back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely. Allah mentioned in the Quran, into, into Islam kafatan. Completely, wholeheartedly. So there are dominant customs, persuasions within the individual, personalized styles, trends that establish innovations. Sisters want to add something, a little twist to their hijab. They want to put a little flower up here. You want to put a little split on the side of the skirt. Little things to make it a little chic, you know. You want to put a little um, Gloria Vanderbilt on it. Or the other one with the cross, what's her name? You know, you sisters know the one with the cross, what's her name? You want to put a little style designer thing to it. It's not enough that you cover it. You want to be designer covered. So there are prevailing customs and persuasions and personalized trends that establish innovations. And when you establish an innovation, what you basically do is you undermine the sunnah. Then there is direct opposition and intervention by non-Muslim governments and authorities, such as what has happened in France. Direct opposition and intervention by non-Muslim governments and authorities for various Islamic practices and rights of Muslim women and the fulfillment of their responsibilities. Number six, aspersion and dialectical confusion. Aspersion means to put something in a bad light. To speak about something in so which you cause confusion in people's minds. You say something, well, you say, yeah, in the Quran, God says this, or Muhammad says this, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. However, it don't make sense. It's not even rational. So, you know, the Kafirs, this is how they talk. Or non-Muslim intellectuals say that this was done in the time of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but we have no need to do that now because now we have modern facilities. So we have aspersion, putting it in a bad or negative light, and dialectical, meaning using words to confuse people, created by intellectuals from the Muslim community, who most of them are conservatives and non-Muslim orientalists. That is, non-Muslims who academically know more about Islam than most Muslims, but Allah blocked them from the guidance. So they are donkeys carrying books. Number seven. Resistance to the Islamic ahkam and lack of respect for the sunnah by Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and the, and the Muslim lady, she says, walakin, however, or my situation is this, or my situation is that. Or her husband says, yeah, but however, our Allah knows best. So we resist the Islamic ruling. Or when we are given a ruling by a scholar, we're not satisfied until we go to two or three other scholars, until we find a scholar who will answer us the way we like it. Or we have a lack of respect for the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because we think that what he ordered us to do, this was back in the days like antiquity. 
We say, well, you know, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu they didn't have certain uh, technological, intellectual, scientific facilities. We don't have to do that anymore because we are advanced people, which means we are saying that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's wahi to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was not advanced as we are today. Number eight, the preponderance, that is the preference of blind following is a terminology, it is called taqlid. Now taqlid is permissible for some people, blind following of madhabs. Because if you or I, if we do not have the ability to understand from where the mujtahid got his evidence, we can follow him. Because we have to have evidence. If we don't know from where he got it from, we can follow him blindly. Why? Because we have to follow the evidence. But if we have the ability to know from where he got the evidence, we cannot blindly follow because they are not absolute. Imam Abu Hanifa, Rahmatullah Alayhi, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, they were not absolute and their statements are not absolute because the companions of the Prophet وسلم, they were not absolute yet they were companions of the Prophet وسلم. and the companions of the Prophet وسلم, never took any one of themselves and considered their word the last word in any issue. So if the companions of the Prophet وسلم, didn't accept each other as the last word on any issue but that their position was we take and we leave from everyone, illa Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We take and we leave evidence from anyone, illa Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why? Because from Allah it is absolute. From the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is absolute. And where there is ijma'a from companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it is also absolute. But Imam Shafi'i, Imam Hanbal, Imam Malik. Abu Hanifa, they were not of that category, although they themselves were relying upon that kind of evidence. So when we want to use them as a doorway, as a school, as a platform, we are using them to obtain what? The evidence. We're not using them themselves as the evidence, we're using them to lead us to the evidence. So what becomes the dalil for us? What is, the, what, what is the ruling for us, the source for us? It is the evidence itself. However, some Muslims, they insist on saying, Sheikh so-and-so, Mufti so-and-so, the elders, Imam so-and-so, a scholar so-and-so, and they're using that person's name or they're using that person's opinion as a final source and they're stuck on it and they don't care what you say. Even if you give them a stronger hadith, and even if you give them, if they give you an ayah, and there has been something called nasak wal mansur, they give you an ayah which has been abrogated, and you tell them this ayah has been abrogated, they tell you, I don't care, the sheikh he told me. This is called blind following. So one of the problems is that most of the Muslims, or many of them, they are blind following, they don't care about references. Secondly, they're not only blindly following scholars, but they're also blindly following personalities. And sometimes the personalities they're following is just personalities who they like, how they look. He's a singer or he's a reciter of Quran or he's a, he's a imam of the masjid, you like his beard or his turban, you know he graduated from such a university or whatever it is and I don't care, that's my man, that's my imam. Fixation upon personalities and blindly following scholars. Number nine, I don't want anybody to say that I, Khalid said we should not follow madhabs, I didn't say that or that we should not 
give the scholars their due. I didn't say that. I qualified it, inshallah. Number nine, ideologically arguing and blaming, which leads to accusations and condemning. So we have some Muslims who are so right that everybody else is wrong. We got Muslims who are criti uh, critiques of the Muslims. So when a sister walks in the door, they look at the sister and say, oh, her hijab is not right. Oh, her slippers is not right. Oh, her dress is not right. Oh, she didn't sit right. Oh, she's not eating right. Oh, her house is not right. Oh, her children is not right. Oh, she recited that wrong or so and so. So we are become so much crit critiques of the Muslims that everybody becomes wrong except us or our group or our leader. This is called ideologically arguing, blaming, criticizing, leading to accusing people and giving them names. We have Muslims today who have given names for everybody. If you say something, they say, oh, he's a Qutbi. Oh, he's a Sururi. Oh, he's a Salafi. Oh, he's a Shi'i. Or he's a Khariji. Or he is Ash'ari. Or he or she is this or that. Or he's a Mubtadi. Today we have 25 or 30 different names and categories that we want to put the Muslims in. And once you put them in that category, you feel comfortable who they are. And the question then is what category are you in? Most of the people, when they put everybody in the category, they're going to say they are Firqatun Najiyah, the rightly guided group, because that's the only one that's left. These accusations, inevitably, when people disagree with your accusations, then it leads to the final thing, which is condemnation. You wind up calling people kafirs. You wind up calling people munafiks. You wind up calling people this and calling people that. And once you start calling people these names, eventually it leads to the shedding of blood or the removing of honor. The last thing, groups that adopt extreme behaviors and mentalities vis-a-vis -vis other Muslims and themselves, that is, they start to see themselves in some real self-righteous position. And then they begin to isolate themselves away from other Muslims. And they start telling other Muslims, you can't sit with that Muslim. You can't eat with that Muslim. You, can't, uh, you take, can't take knowledge from that Muslim. You can't visit that Muslim. You can't say salam to that Muslim. You can't this, you can't say that. And eventually what happens, those people wind up in, painted in their own corner. And when they get painted in their own corner, they also start breaking down in their own group. And they start creating the other until there's only one person left. This is a historical pro set of problems. I'm pointing these problems out from a point of history and sociology. When you go into the sources that I have given to you, you will see the solution, the position, uh, and the evaluation, uh, and the proof of those problems. Now, uh, dear sisters, I want to just, uh, just go over these um, sites with you, and you don't have to worry about it. What we're going to do is, um, what's the name of that news, the newsletter that comes out again? Oh, just a moment, don't say it, don't say it. The brother, he wrote it for me. It's called the Wake Up Call newspaper. Um, so you will find it in the Wake Up Call newspaper. All of these will be printed for you in their next uh, edition. And also, um, the transcript of my presentation to you today, uh, we will ask them also to put it there, and also these sites. Let me just go over them with you quickly, inshallah. Uh, the first one is on the position of Muslim women or, or women in Islam and in Islamic society by Dr. And this is supposed to be Hassan Turabi. I'm sorry. Can you correct that for me, brother? Hassan Turabi? 
you don't have to write it, sisters, inshallah, because you're going to get it all um, um, corrected for you and proof for it. Uh, I need this to say Hassan. Dr. Hassan Turabi is a, um, um, a well-known Muslim scholar. Um, and he has written a very beautiful treatise on the position of women in society uh, that you will appreciate, inshallah. And uh, this happens to be his um, field of expertise also. Um, the next one is The Rights and Duties of Women. And this is a 24-page booklet by Dr. Suhaib Hassan. Uh, mashallah, uh, he's on our board of trustees. And also, uh, he has written many other little small books called Introduction to the Science of Hadith. Uh, um, many good small books he has written. Uh, he's the Imam of Masjid, um, Masjid Tawheed in London. Um, the Rights and Duties of Women. The, the third one is uh, Women's Role in Contemporary Society. This is written by um, a Muslim sister. Uh, and I found it to be, mashallah, very well written and a, a good reference. Uh, number, I can't seem to find number four here. Or is there a four? Maybe not. Uh, young Muslim and female in America by a sister by the name of Anissa Nadir. A sister who is basically writing her experience being young, Muslim, and female in America and the challenges that are involved. Uh, interaction between men and women on the internet, Sheikh Salman Auda. Um, you will find his fatawa available on uh, a website called um, uh, Islam Today. Um, Sheikh Salman Auda. Women in the Quran and Sunnah by Professor Abdurrahman Doi. Mashallah, um, a very capable and um, um, prestigious Muslim scholar who has written many things uh, on social and political issues relative to women. Uh, hijab in the Quran and the Sunnah, another very beautiful uh, research paper that has been prepared. And uh, you will be able to access these by just putting, going into Google and uh, putting in the titles themselves. Um, not gaggle, but Google. Uh, the Muslim woman and her rights, um, and again by Islamic world, islamicworld.net, a sister site, um, a very beautiful site also. Um, niqab, according to the Quran and Sunnah, www.everymuslim.com. And uh, for the sisters who uh, don't know what the terminology niqab means, it means uh, the part of the hijab which covers the face and also includes the wearing of the gloves, um, uh, which is uh, a part of uh, the sunnah of the Prophet wasalam, and justified by his sunnah and, and authentic hadith. Niqab, according to the Quran and sunnah. Women in society, again by Professor Abdurrahman Doi. Make way for the women. Uh, another very good uh, article that uh, I read and I thought that you sisters would appreciate. Women in Society, www.allahuakbar.net. The Quran and Women, www.quranicteachings. I kind of think that is .co.uk. Uh, so if you don't mind here, I'm going to put a dot here because usually that should be a dot. Uh, well, the brother, he'll have to do that. You see, I'm not that technologically uh, advanced. Uh, the Islamic Movement and Women's Activity, a very extensive um, socially and politically written um, uh, uh, research paper um, written by Dr. or Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi, who is the convener or the chairman of the, uh, the Fiqh Committee for Europe. Um, and most of us know Sheikh Yusuf Qaradawi from one of his very famous books, Halal and Haram Fit Islam, and many other books that he has written. Uh, number 16, and uh, this one uh, is a very special one uh, because this particular one, it has about 55 or 60 different links. Muslim women's homepage, Muslim women in the Sunnah. So I think, sisters, that inshallah, if you will make reference to these. Um, 
uh, if you will go to these references and use them, uh, I think, inshallah, many of the questions that you're going to ask me uh, can be answered. So from this uh, point, what we'll do is we'll try to start to um, respond to some of these questions. Now, some of them, the, are these the ones? What I've done was the, most of the questions, if the sisters went to the sites, um, all of these questions would probably be answered. Yes. So we've left that for the sites. To, uh, sisters to sorry, uh, investigate and research themselves. Jazakallah khair. And these ones are more socially related. And, um, which okay, so I'll deal with these, and if I think, and if I think I cannot deal with them, I'll hand them back to Sheikh Faisal here. Uh, the first question says, uh, domestic violence is becoming an issue among the Muslim community. Too many of the victims, uh, they find it hard to talk to Muslims, fearing people will talk. At the same time, they fear to go to certain government groups because their advice are not according to Islam. Please advise us of what to do in such situations. <clears throat> I think that um, it's necessary here first, always exhaust, exhaust the availability and the accessibility of the Muslims of responsibility. I mean, if there are 15 or 20 masjids in this city where the prayer is being led and where Jum'ah prayer is being given, if there's a problem a sister she has and she cannot get it done, uh, fixed or resolved in her locale, she needs to go with her mahram to every place where there is some residue of Islamic responsibility or authority until she gets it resolved. Now, it may take a long time to do it, but I'll just remind you of this, that some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, they traveled for months and years just to get a authentication for a hadith. So don't look for a shake and bake answer. Don't look for something, a phone call, or just somebody going to send you a fatwa over the internet and uh, make an appointment, you're going to go there and they're going to give you a stamp and a seal and that's it. No. If it's something that you want and you need, sometimes, sister, you're going to have to stand in line. You're going to have to be frustrated. You're going to have to go and wait somewhere all day long and the people don't answer you or whatever it is. It may take you a year just to get the issue resolved. If you don't get it resolved by going through that procedure, shame on the Muslim leaders. Shame on them. Your next recourse I would suggest for you is that you go outside of that locale seeking people who have a reputation for responding to these kinds of issues, who have written on these kinds of issues, who may have websites are giving fatawa on these kinds of issues, have your situation certified. That means what you understand it to be, have it certified by witnesses. Write it down and have seals put towards it. And then send it to a mufti. Now it may take three months, four months, whatever, for them to read it, get back to it, and send it back to you or whatever. But if a mufti responds to you with a certified fatwa, it is the same as if he was in your locale. Even though that fatwa may not be able to be executed, because usually when a mufti gives a fatwa, the government has another area of the government that executes it. Like a judge, he gives a judgment in the court, right? But the police, they execute it. He makes a judgment, somebody goes to jail. He makes a judgment, something is dissolved. But unfortunately, when a mufti from another place gives a fatwa, there's nobody to execute it sometimes. But at least you have the fatwa in front of you. That's one way. Another way is that Muslim sisters and Muslim men should form research groups, help support groups that sit down with individuals and hear their situation and, and hold it in confidence. And then write it up for them, write a synopsis for them, and then filter it to the people of responsibility so that what I just mentioned can be done. Now, this is a long process, but it is one of the processes which you're going to have to learn to resort to 
because we are not living in ideal circumstances. And sisters, let me just remind you of something I said previously. Even if you were living in a Muslim country, you may still not have access to do what I'm telling you. So don't think because you're living in Australia, somebody said, I wish I was living in a Muslim country, these Kafirs, so and so and so. No. Maybe if you were living in a Muslim country, you'd find it even more difficult. So I'm just trying to give you some suggestions. The other thing is my suggestion for all of you is that your families should be attached to a student of knowledge or to a scholar or to someone who themselves um, are closely attached to students of knowledge or a scholar. Why? Because if your family is attached to that kind of a person, you are learning from that kind of a person, that person can facilitate that knowledge for you better than anyone else. But this means that you have to become accountable to that person. You can't use that person like a doorknob. Oh, I'm going to see Sheikh so-and-so, I'm going to see Sheikh so-and-so, and the only time you go to see them or respect them is when you want something. No. If you go to that person and your family is attached to that person, you should become accountable to that person for your knowledge so that if there's something wrong with you or your family, they can advise you and you will correct yourself. So it's a two-way street here. Sorry, Sheikh Khalid. Just on this issue, um, on a different perspective, concerning domestic violence, it's uh, very advisable for any lady who is uh, to actually take measures before it comes to that situation of violence. Mm. Um, now, violence... I'm not sure she's just mentioned domestic violence, which can be broken down into physical, emotional, and mm -hmm. those sort of things. But I think uh, what we should keep in mind is before a situation actually leads to uh, physical violence or any such kind, you need to see someone about that, mm -hmm. whether it's the family or the sheikh that's um, connected to your family. Before it leads to such a situation, the sister should have the courage, inshallah, to actually address the situation before it um, goes out of control exactly. and leads to a situation where we need to go to the courts, we need to go to the law and non-Muslim institutions. So inshallah, just keep that in mind. Um, we need to solve the problem before it reaches that uh, uh, situation. Inshallah. Yeah, the, law, uh, the next question is, uh, is emotional neglect a valid reason for khula? That is, the husband does not uh, uh, ask about the wife's emotional feelings. No, this is not, uh, this is not a fundamental reason for khula. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had told you to be patient. How you just, uh, you, 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 your husband, he makes you cry. Your husband, he makes you sad. He doesn't give you the warmth or the love that you think that you expect and you want khula. No, this is not a justifiable reason. I have to remind you, sisters, that there are women who, because they want to preserve the integrity of their marriage and their children and their home, that they live with a man and they undergo his uh, 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 the inconveniences or insults or other things or even he doesn't satisfy them uh, or whatever the case might be and she remains in that situation for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's a special blessing for that kind of woman. But the woman who is looking for just, you know, the, the slightest thing, he makes me cry, I'm, I'm emotionally unstable, and he doesn't respond to me or whatever, the, the, he didn't cut the air conditioner on when he came in last night, or she's looking for khula. What she wants to be in the marriage for? Khula is an extreme situation. But be careful about it, sisters, because the Prophet said, Allah curses the woman who asks for a divorce while she does not have justification for it. Yes, Jazakallah Khair. If you live in another country with your husband away from your family, is it permissible for you to travel to your parents without a mahram? That is, we can only afford for one of us to go. Uh, this is a question, sisters, that you can uh, this, you can get, have this answered on one of these here sites here because there's uh, uh, Sheikh Salman Auda, Sheikh Yusuf Qardawi, uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh um, um, uh, um, um, Sheikh Salim Halali. There's many 
uh, different uh, scholars, Sheikh Ibn Jabreen, many of them, they have sites, and you can put this in and they will answer it. Or they already have fat fatawa already written. And also, there's a set of books called Fatawa, which is, uh, you can get from Dar es Salaam. Uh, there's a book distributors. It's a set of Fatawa. There are four books now. And I think they have a collection of over 3,000 Fatawa. And it's by the, uh, uh, the, um, the higher uh, um, level of ulama and fuqaha of Saudi Arabia. About five different ulama, they have collected these fatawa. So if you can get these books for your home, inshallah, you will find, inshallah, answer for that. Uh, sister says, I work in a large, I'm going to go through them quickly because it says 15 or 20 minutes. I'm going to see if I can s stretch it to 25 minutes. Uh, I work in a large company and uh, most social events, gatherings uh, uh, involve alcohol held in parks, etc. I still have um, to interact with colleagues uh, in my career. What shall I do? Well, you have to tiptoe. You have to tiptoe through the minefield. There are circumstances that you cannot avoid sometimes. Maybe you need to think about a different occupation. Maybe that occupation is hazardous for you. Maybe it carries too much liability for you. Maybe it is not praiseworthy for you. Maybe there's something else better for you that you can do that earns you less money and less prestige. You have to decide that. But if it is the case that you need to stay there, then you have to tiptoe to the minefield, knowing sometimes that you're going to step on something that's going to blow up in your face. That's the, I'm being real with you about it. A Muslim woman must be very careful about her environment because her reputation is at stake all the time. And once your reputation is ruined, it's very difficult for you to get it back. What if a Muslim woman does not have a male to accompany her? I needed to go back to my country to see my family and I didn't have a mahram. Uh, that's the same answer. And also, a sister mentioned to me that, you know, today there's a little um, trend that sisters are going to hajj with no mahram. It's very clear, sisters, you cannot make hajj without mahram. Now, from what I understand, there is a provision. Uh, and uh, the, the ulama and the fuqaha have made a provision like this, that if you are traveling in a group uh, and there is a, a legal mahram for you in that group, that group can be as a mahram for you if there is a person who one of the sisters in that group has mahram for her, uh, but you cannot be uh, uh, alone with that particular person, but there is some provision for that. But I think you need to really look into it and uh, examine it and don't just, you know, get your ticket, pay for it and just jump in a uh, go with a group and you're at the airport, Bismillah, I'm going to Hajj, and you're walking all around every place and you got nobody escorting you. Because in that case, sister, you are in a situation where perhaps you nullify your Hajj because you didn't even look into the protection of the issue of Mahram. How did the wives of the Prophet ﷺ become so knowledgeable? They was married to the Messenger of Allah wasallam. They, the Wahi was coming in front of them. And also, Allah blessed them to be people who they acclimated themselves and conformed themselves that even when they were in